The following presentation was recorded at the 2011 Southeast Linux Fest in Spartanburg, South Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond and Platinum sponsors in 2011 for helping make these videos possible. Start now. So, hi everyone, my name is Klaatu, and um, this talk was originally titled The Auteur Video Editor. And um, the Auteur Video Editor was a very exciting new project that I was working on with a friend of mine, and it was going to be a video editor done absolutely the correct way. Um, this is the beginning of the Auteur program, which was a bunch of shell scripts um, by me uh, that enabled me to edit video on the command line. Um, not a hugely popular idea, not what you would call a user-friendly solution, but it was um, something that we started, that I started just uh, really so that I was able to do uh, my job. Uh, to give you a little bit of background on my job, um, I am a, uh, well, I was a film student and I segued from film student to a film crew member and would work on a couple of independent films here and there. And then I got hired um, by a, a film school to, to teach uh, filmmaking to students. So um, I'm, I'm really kind of caught up in the multimedia content creation world. Um, and so the fact that I happened to get into Linux and still wanted to maintain the other passion, which was multimedia content creation, um, kind of sent me down a search for a really good video editor on, on Linux. So um, this was the beginning of that. And for about, I'd say, two months straight, we, we worked on Auteur a lot. And it was really exciting because it was written in Python, PyQt actually. Um, so that was the, the cute sort of like KDE-ish toolkit and the Python uh, fancy programming language that I don't understand. Um, and, it, and it was working really well. And it adhered to a lot of the things that I knew that in order to edit video professionally, you, would, you needed to have these ideas in mind. Um, one of the ideas is, for instance, being able to make sub-clips out, out of your footage or make sequences out of those clips and be able to play them back and things like that. So um, I don't know how many of you actually have really thought about how films are edited, um, but this is 35 millimeter film. Um, this is what movies are made of, quite literally. Um, and it comes on these big reels and you put it in a camera and you, um, you shoot the, the film, and there's a photochemical uh, reaction on the celluloid, this stuff, uh, with light, and the parts of the uh, little, there's little silver halide particles. If you look really close, you still won't be able to see them, but if we projected it, you'd actually be able to see those little halide particles. Um, they get transformed into, into, into silver particles, and they get washed away by the developer, chemicals and stuff like that. And then we develop, then you get this film back. And if you look at it through the light, you can actually see little images of people. Um, and if you stopped by my Slacker Media booth, uh, you, you were able to actually look and find out what these images were of. Um, and, you, and that's how movies are made. But, but obviously, we don't want to just shoot our film all completely linear, right? I mean, that's not how movies are made. You, you shoot one scene, and then you call cut, and then you shoot it. <laughs> a scene that might happen in the same location, but in the story of a movie, it happens like 30 days later. So everyone changes their costumes, and you mess the place up and make it look like it's a different day, and then they do the whole scene again. And then you go back through and start cutting up your film. So cutting up film, uh, traditionally, um, is simply looking through the film strips, finding the frame that you like, and doing it up to the light like this is really hard, but you, you can do it this way, and they, and they did it this way very traditionally, and then they'd, they'd cut it, and they'd say, okay, this, this piece is kind of trash, so we'll 
ditch that, that stuff ends up on the cutting room floor. That, if you, has anyone heard that expression? That's why they call it that, because that's what they do, just like that. They look at this and they say, wow, I'll never use that. Um, so then they keep going through and they say, oh, here's the shot that I want to cut on. And so then they cut it again, not with a knife, by the way. They have fancy razors. So this is now, and I'm exaggerating, I'm making it shorter just so that we can exaggerate, um, so we don't actually have feet and feet of film. But let's say that this is now scene, scene one. This is our opening scene. Actually, since we cut this first, let's make this, this is our last scene. So we put that on our little, it's actually we put it in a bin. Um, and they're big metal bins, and they're very clean, they're free of dust, and they've got little hangers at the top, and you can hang them down so that they don't hit the floor. We try to keep the film a little bit neat. And so then you look through and say, oh yeah, I remember that, that take, that was really bad. This, the, the actor wasn't really looking in the right direction. It was not terrible, we're not gonna throw it on the cutting room floor, we're gonna put it in a different bin. So we're gonna save it for later in case we absolutely need to come back to it. And then we got another piece here. Now, this is the first scene, so then, that's the last scene, that's the first scene. Now we need our middle scene. Uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't here, I remember this take was really bad. Not terrible, but pretty bad. This stuff was horrible. And yep, yeah, this is it, this is the take. And of course, in real life, I would have what's called a moviola in front of me. And I'd be putting this film through this little moviola, which is basically a little, well, you're not gonna be able to see it over a black terminal, I guess. But it's basically a little projector, a mini projector, just for the, the film editor. And you can kind of look at it, and it, it sort of projects it just, just enough for me to be able to, to actually see the image. So this is our middle scene. And so then we've got our first scene, we've got our middle scene, and we got our last scene, and now we've got our movie. But you know what? That cut between that first and that last scene isn't exactly what I had in mind, so now I'm gonna go back through, and I'm gonna do, that, that's my first cut. Now I'm gonna do a little bit, or a rough cut. I'm gonna do a little bit of trimming, it's garbage. And we'll just cut, we'll cut a little bit earlier out of the, the, the last scene. And now we've got our final cut. And we would take little pieces of tape, believe it or not, and we would paste the tape, we would, we would paste all these little film strips together, and then we'd send it away to the lab and they would um, look at the very edge of the film and there's little numbers on the edge of the film. And they'd say, okay, so on his, on his copy of the film, he cut at frame, uh, or actually foot, foot number uh, 20 and then cut again at foot number uh, 30. This is 10 feet right here, doesn't look like it. Um, so then he'd go back to the original film, like a, a re the original film, he'd make a copy of that so this would be his nice copy of your movie. He would find 10 feet in, and he would do exactly, basically make the same cuts as you did. And then you would run that clean copy back through another printer and make another copy of that copy so that now you've got a completely non-cut film, just like this, with all of your edits in it, if that makes any sense. And that's the copy that they consider their gold master. And from that they then make more copies and send it out all, to all the movie theaters all across the world and we go watch them in the theaters. And that's how filmmaking has been done since literally 1890. You know, I mean, it's a long time ago. I don't quote me on the date, I, I don't know, but it's a long time, it's like 100 years, you know, they, they've been doing um, filmmaking that way. And for some reason, uh, at some point, computers entered the picture and they were helping us do a lot of those middle steps where you could cut the film, but we didn't actually have to cut it. Um, and then we would, we would just take the little numbers off of what we just edited and we'd go back to the film and we'd, we'd, do, we'd, we'd say, okay, so he virtually cut from foot 10 to 20, so I'll really cut here and here and then, and then I'll cut here and here and make a copy of it. So um, that's computers started getting into it, and then later on it finally switched over to where the computers were actually powerful enough to do all of that stuff. So we could shoot on film and then transfer it to digital, or we could just shoot digitally and edit it all in the computer and spit it back out and distribute. Um, none of the, none of the, um, none of the video editing applications for Linux up until 
actually really, really recently, seemed to quite be able to replicate that workflow. Because that workflow was a very professional uh, workflow. And oh, there's this sort of illusion in the consumer market, I think, uh, that if it's a professional way of doing things, it's too complex for the everyday person. They will never understand. They don't need to do all that. They just want something simple. And enter iMovie and other applications like that where you don't get to look at your footage the same way and cut it up and then rearrange it and, and have that same kind of workflow on your computer. Um, so I, I was seeking to replicate that in Auteur. Um, and then the main developer of Auteur, the only developer of Auteur, got busy with um, his real life work um, as a dentist and had to write, um, it was, it started writing himself a dental management, patient management software called Open Molar, which is apparently really, really good, but I'm not, um, I'm not making that up either, but I'm not a dentist, so I don't know if it's really good, but I'm sure it's very good. Um, but so Autour died. Um, and someone, people kept talking to me about um, this, this old project that I'd known about and I'd really kind of liked but could never really get to work for me called Cadian Live. And some other people were talking to me about this project called OpenShot. And I was like, yeah, I don't know if they're really ready because I tried them, you know, and they weren't really great. And um, finally at the Indiana Linux Fest about four months ago or three months ago, um, so the, the person who was going to give a talk actually about Cadian Live called out sick and they asked me to step in for that person. Um, I was like, I haven't used Cadian Live in ages. I can't really do that. And I didn't. I, I did a presentation on the way that I did my, edit, my editing, which involved a bunch of shell scripts and Blender, um, it, which is great. Uh, but after that, I thought, well, if this guy was going to do a talk on Cadian Live, there must be something to it. So I, I checked it out again, and it turns out that Cadian Live is, has come an amazingly long uh, way from where it began. Uh, they just released point 0.8, 0 .8, which honestly I think should have been a 1.0 release. Um, they've just gotten hosting, as I understand from a blog post that I read two days ago. I think they just got hosting on the KDE uh, server space. So they're, they're still not um, a family, you know, you're not going to uh, sudo apt get install KDE and get KDE in live. It's not a part of KDE, but it's, it's, it's getting there. Um, so uh, to install KDE in live, because there are so many different video codecs out there, um, you have to really kind of work at it, unfortunately. It's not a really, I mean, I guess on some distributions it might be a one-click install. Um, I happen to run uh, Slackware, and so I wanted to make sure that I had all the latest and greatest versions of the codecs because, I mean, this is kind of what I do. The video editing part of things is really kind of takes precedence over anything else. So um, I figured that I should make sure that they're all up to date. I went to research what I needed. Turns out there's a guy maintaining a list of all the package versions that you need for the latest version. And just for a sample of, of the stuff that we need, we, we, we grab AMR, uh, which is one of those sort of, um, well, some mobile things use it a lot. Um, FAAD, which is for AAC and uh, decoding. GSM, LibDC1394, which is for firewire capture. Uh, LibVPX, which is um, the uh, WebM stuff, Orc, no clue, Schrodinger, Speaks, X264, of course we probably all know that one, I mean that's, your phone probably records that or your, your camcorder probably does, uh, and then of course um, the FFmpeg uh, stuff as well. Uh, and then you've got other, I guess, threatened by patent ownership codecs, FAAC and LAME. Uh, once you've got all your codecs up to date, which again, on your distribution, it might be literally just su-c, yum install, Kadian live, and it'll probably just grab all this and update it for you. But for me, on this box, um, I just did it manually. Uh, Freeor, which is uh, some digital graphic stuff. QJSON, which um, is some kind of programmer thing that someone explained to me 
yesterday, but I still don't understand. MLT, which is the back end of KDN Live, that's the one that makes all your media play and, and mix instantly and stuff like this. And then finally, KDN Live 0.8. Um, the cool thing about this is that very, very recently, um, there was a really sort of big, exciting uh, patch to the kernel. It was like apparently 200 lines of code that they made. Uh, and it, it only appears in the 2.6.38, I think the .4, I, I don't really know, but it's, it's that one. That kernel right there uh, has this 200 patch, uh, 200 line patch in it, which apparently really, really removes a lot of the, the need to go through your kernel and patch it for real timidness. Um, I can't, I, I haven't, um, this is still a fairly fresh box. I haven't been able to really verify that I don't feel a need for real time kernel stuff yet because I haven't, I don't feel like I've pounded enough with like software synths and real time effects and stuff like that. But in terms of um, KDN live performance, it's, it's really stellar on this kernel. So, um, so if you want to, if, if you can update to that, uh, that kind of kernel, or if you just want to custom compile it, um, then that's kind of the kernel that right now I'm kind of like vouching for. I, I'm really enjoying the, the 2.6.38.4 kernel. Really love it. Just think about it all day. Um, it sounds really geeky to be like, oh, this kernel is so cool. Um, okay. So, um, so the, uh, the workflow then, as we know, is we shoot. And we're not going to go over shooting film right now or, or shooting video. I mean, I could give you lots of tips on that if you want to talk later, but um, lighting, just lighting and a lens, that's what you need. Um, so, you know, you shoot and then you have to look at your footage, right? You have to identify it. And on the computer, you can do that within KDN Live or you can just do it within your desktop. I actually, I, I actually just like to do it within my desktop. I just, I go find the footage. And I, lay, I look at it and I say, okay, this is uh, me at the KDE booth. Um, yeah, I remember that take. That was a good take. So I'll just rename that clip. Clatu at KDE. And now I've got that clip labeled um, for myself so that I actually know what it is. Naming conventions, I like to keep them pretty simple. For instance, I know that all of this is at self 2011. I don't have to say self 2011 um, uh, documentary footage, you know, and then Klaatu. Forget that. It's Klaatu at KDE. Um, if it's um, if it's a if it's a movie that you're shooting, or or you have lots of angles of the same thing, you might want to do something like underscore long shot, or actually it would be more really of a let's call it a medium shot, and this would be take one. That's the kind of convention that I typically use, and I've seen a lot of other people uh, kind of adhere to. Um, and I would keep, I would, I would do that throughout, but we're not going to do it right now. And, and besides, it's kind of cheating KD and Live because uh, by no means do we have to do it that way. That's just how I like to do it because I, I like modularity, I guess. I, or maybe that's just how I kind of started doing it. So, so here's KD and Live. Um, this is not the default layout. When you, when you first open it up, it, it opens some win a, lot, a lot more windows than I, I feel you really actually need. Um, but the, the concept would be this little guy right here, which is now moving around, um, is this guy right here, is, um, is my bin. So the bin is where I'm keeping all of my footage that I'm pretty sure, well, it's really, the bin is where I'm keeping all of my footage, period. Um, but it would be after I'd kind of cut it into clips Sort of, it's not quite analogous because we could actually cut it more. But that's, this is the place where we keep all of our raw footage. And a simple um, right click in, and adding a footage will we'll put that right into your bin. Um, so it goes into our bin. And right now it's warning me. This looks bad, right? Uh-oh, my demo is going bad. Something's wrong. I'm getting an error message. No, it's not. Actually, I expected this. And this is normal. And it's actually really, really an advanced feature. This, this was something that everyone got really excited about when all the video editors um, like Avid and Final Cut started doing it. They were like, oh my gosh, you're telling me that I'm, trying to that, I'm, that I'm starting a 
that I'm importing a clip that is 640 by 480 at 2997 frames per second, but that I had earlier in my configuration of KD and Live told you to default to a 720 by 480 frame rate. I think I probably set it to 2997. So it's telling me that there's a disparity between what I told it at the very beginning when I first installed KD and Live, what I was like gonna normally be working with versus what I'm telling it that I actually wanna work with right now. Um, in this case, since all of our clips are gonna be the same size, I'm gonna go ahead and say, yeah, switch over my, my working space or my profile as they call it to a 640 by 480 space. That doesn't mean I can't drag other frame sizes in there. It just means that if I do, I might have to convert it or do some weird things or let Kadian invisibly convert it for me, stuff like that. Um, this right here would be our Moviola. The Moviola was the thing where I would be able to look at my film through a magic little viewer. See, sort of, you can kind of see that. Um, you can kind of see the, the footage and the editor would look at it and kind of see um, what exactly the footage is of and if they need to carve it down anymore. So it's basically us going like this, you know, looking at the little tiny frames in there, figuring out what the footage is of. So you see how there's a little time there where I, I'm not really speaking. So we might wanna wait for me to find my frame. And I simply mark in, well, I mark in. And we figure that I'm probably talking a lot. Looks like I had a little bit of a mistake there, but it's fine. And we'll cut out there, let's say. So I've just marked an in and out space within a larger clip. So then if I drag what I've marked down here to my timeline, suddenly I've, I simply come in and here's my actual project. Don't get distracted by the, 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 the view that's still kind of there just extraneously. This is what we're working with now. This and this are always the same. The frame that's gonna show right here is where my playhead is positioned in the frame, in, in the timeline. So at the very beginning of my movie here, I've got me looking at the camera, and at the very end, oops, at the very end, I've got me looking down at the screen. And to view that, I could... And here we are in this view. This is um, all about people in the four point six, which is kind of the newest, uh, latest, greatest release of and there it is. That's, so that's our first shot in our little project. Uh, it's showing me the length down here of the, 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 the total project. Um, and it's showing me the view of both the video and the audio all bundled up into one little self-contained uh, region. Uh, that might work for you. It might not. You can always split the audio and actually you know, have your, your audio down here on a separate track. We're still seeing it as, if you notice, two waveforms in one colorful box. And the reason for that is simply because it is stereo sound, but it's, it's been recorded uh, as, it's not dual mono, it's a stereo track. So that's why we're seeing that. If you have a fancier setup, you might see two, two distinct waveforms down there at the audio track. Um, so that's really the workflow of KDN, to be honest, but let's, let's continue just to kind of emulate a little bit more of, of, of that setup. Um, This, all these clips, by the way, came from uh, the LibreOffice booth out there. Um, he graciously donated his camera for a little while as he was trying to get documentary footage of people's reactions to LibreOffice and stuff like that. Let me use uh, his camera so that I could get some footage of the fest, and that was much appreciated. Looking for the beginning of my...
So this is cutaway footage of, uh, of the fest. And that's not the one I'm looking for. This is it. All right, so another clip of me. I guess one of the coolest features of uh, this year's festival. I guess one of the coolest features of. Uh, I guess one of the coolest features. Of, I guess one of the coolest. Um, so if you're, let's do this. So if we're if we're not finding the frame exactly where we want to cut in, obviously. Being too um, too precise in this stage is not really it doesn't really benefit us because we're not really sure how it's going to look anyway once we start cutting it all together. So we might as well get um, just roughly the footage that we think we need. We know that we want me introducing the coffee booth, so we drag that down into our timeline. And then we also know from this same clip, I did a very bad cameraman thing and included my cutaway in my in my uh, conversation, in, in the clip where I'm introducing it, but that's okay, we can deal with that. We can just mark in again from this new point and get some cutaway of this person making coffee and drag that down there, and then we've got that. So now if we watch the whole, the whole project, Okay, pretty, pretty rough cut, right? So um, this would be the stage of, of, of refining your edit. It's a common stage. It's done all the time. Uh, control shift plus will zoom in to the timeline so that you can start getting much, much more precise. This stuff right here is the SMPTE time code, which again, for, for Linux to be giving me SMPTE time code is a hugely significant achievement. I've been looking for this in Blender for a long time. They, I think they actually do have it now in 257, um, but it was, it just, it's taken forever. In, I mean, that's because animators don't use time code. They use uh, frame numbers, so it's not, it's not surprising that they didn't do that. It's just, it's nice to see it in a video editing program that they have proper SMPTE time code. Um, so you can, if you, if you are an editor and care about SMPTE time code, you can look at that. You can be excited about it. And then you can get right at the frame uh, that you think you want to cut. And then you can do some inline cutting. Um, there's, of course, really great keyboard shortcuts. So if, if I hit uh, X, I get this cool little, little scissor icon. But if I don't know the keyboard sh shortcut, I can go up to the tool menu and find my razor tool, um, which is X. And then I can use the razor tool. Oops, I actually moved my playhead. And cut the footage uh, in two parts. Uh, the S key gets me my select tool again. And I can now see what I've done. I've, um, I've grabbed that video footage and separated it from this bit right here. Now, if I don't want this piece at all, I can just delete it with the, the delete key. Uh, I could have also saved that for later or something. Um, and now we've got hopefully a cleaner cut. It's a cleaner cut. It's a little bit rough because there's simply no, there's no transition there. There's nothing, um, nothing really distracting us from the fact that, yes, we are cutting away now. The, the classic trick for that in, in pretty much, uh, whether it's, it's news or, or a movie or anything that you watch, is, is it's called a cutaway, which means that we... We distract the viewer from the fact that there's a person in the frame on frame right looking at us or looking at a computer, and then suddenly that same person jumps forward in time and in space and is now in front of a completely different hallway talking about coffee in the middle of the frame, very distracting to us. What we can do is hide that cut. We could do a cheesy transition or something like that. Um, or, like I say, it's a little bit more common, I think, to to simply cut to something else. So here's this coffee station that I really was impressed with. Um, so we'll do a little bit of editing that down a little bit more to size. 
uh, and kind of drag it right there onto the top layer of our video track. So this, just like um, uh, GIMP or, or the, the layer section of Inkscapes, is, it's a layer kind of model. So whatever's on the, the bottom of the, of the case, uh, we'll, we'll see as long as there's nothing on top of it. And then when our playhead hits something on top of this, then we'll suddenly start seeing whatever's in the uppermost track. So it's a bird's eye view downward of the, um, well, it's actually a side, side scroller view, but the top, the, we have to imagine that our view, viewpoint is from here, looking down through that playhead. So if we um, just back up just a little bit. And then we cut to coffee. And you could hear that I was, well, you probably couldn't hear. I could hear that I, my voice was still, was still talking because I, I've got my clip under this coffee machine. So it's just one of those shots where, you know, we're looking at coffee, we hear the narrator speaking, and then um, we, we cut away from the coffee and there's the, the speaker carrying on about what we, what we just saw. So very sort of common uh, little trick. Um, it actually is. I have not muted it. Um, I could split it away from that, uh, and then I need to ungroup the clip. So basically, un sorry, going a little bit fast there. Um, so we've got a clip, and the way that the computer's representing it to us right now is it's a colored box that contains both the video and the audio. That's a convenience thing, because usually the audio and the video do go together, because we're, we're filming people who are talking and, and those sounds need to stay together. But sometimes we don't. For instance, we, in this case, we actually want more of my voice and less of that background noise of the, of the coffee cutaway, right? So to bring it out, to bring the, the audio outside of this little box, we simply right click and do a um, split, split audio. So that grabs the audio and takes it out of our little colored box and makes the little colored box all of its own. Now they're still joined because it's still being assumed, and this is a common assumption in any video editor, but it's still being assumed that, well, you don't really want to split the audio away from the video. You want to be able to move them together. You just don't want to have to look at them in the same box. Well, in this case, actually, that's not true. We really do want, just want to get rid of that. So we'll clip on that. Uh, click on that and say ungroup clips. Now if I move the video, it doesn't carry the audio with it. Therefore I could take this audio, I could save it for room tone, um, or I could simply delete it and then it goes away. And then actually I do have the speaker over a, basically a shot that we call MOS, without sound. Silence, and there's the sound again. So we'll we'll just we'll keep the sound going for people, so it's not so disturbing. But that's um, that's how you can split the audio uh, from the video. Are there any other questions before I uh, go on? Cool. It does, and that's exactly what I was about to surprise you with, but then you asked. Um, where is it? There's a lot more uh, effects that there used to be um, since I was first using it, but um, here's what, let's see if it, uh, 
Yeah, I'm pretty sure my, because um, this actually works on my workstation at work, which is a lot more powerful than this computer. Um, so, it, unless I don't have enough footage to dissolve from and to. Let's try cutting this down a little bit. Yeah. Probably not enough either. All right, let's try that. Yeah, it might just not be showing this to me because of this. What's up? Is that right? Hey. Obviously, I'm not much of a dissolve person. Um, So the theory here, since we figured it out, is that you've got a film strip being played in one area, and you've got a, well, let's, let's dissolve from the coffee to the person, for instance. Let's take this out for now. So here's the footage of the coffee. And we'll split that. So let's say that we want to dissolve from the footage, the cutaway of the coffee, to the person talking about the coffee. In order to do that back in the old days, and even in video, since we're basically doing the same thing, um, we would need the footage to literally overlap each other. Because if we had it just end to end like this, then there's nothing really to dissolve from or to. If you dissolved out of this clip, you'd be dissolving down to nothing, and then you'd be dissolving back into this clip. So you'd basically be, be dissolving to a blank screen, which usually is black, and then dissolving back out of a blank screen into your picture, and that's not what you want. Unless you are looking for a fade out, in which case you can do that, but, but we're not. We're looking for a cross dissolve. So you need, we, what we have to do essentially is overlap the clips and then back in the day, what they would do is they would project the light through the film strip. And as they were printing this one to the master copy, they would slowly dial down the light. And suddenly it would go to darkness. And then they would do the same thing here. They'd back up the film a little bit. And they'd start the light out so that it wasn't shining through the strip at all and it was printing nothing. And then it gradually, they turn up the light and it gradually fades into this film strip. And once you look at the copy, you've got basically one thing exposed with the light going away, and then the other one backing up, being exposed as the light increases. And so you get a double image for a little while there. So on the computer, the way that this is done is uh, taking advantage of both video tracks, video track one and, and two. So again, we're doing the whole layered view. And we start out with one clip, and we would really want it to go on for actually longer than we think we really want it to go, because we want to be able to have some extra room, that, extra room there um, where we can do that fade. And so it'll be footage that we kind of like half see and we half don't. So, uh, and then we take that other strip of film and move it under under that strip. So if we look at it this way, of course, we'll still only see the top clip. And then we, it's a hard cut. 
But if we do a add transition, we can do a dissolve transition. And as you can see, I mean, there's a lot more than there used to be back when I was uh, first looking at this application. Um, I, I'm not big into transitions. Uh, the effects I'm a little bit more excited about, but we'll, we'll not go into that yet. Uh, adding transitions, so we're doing a dissolve. And there's the little dissolve box. So it's basically saying, well, how much do you want me, how much do you want me to start fading in and out at? So about midway during this dissolve, we should be about 50% of one and 50% of the other, which I think there that, that looks about right. And then at the end of that dissolve, by that time, the, the top layer should be at 0% at and the bottom clip should be at 100%. And sure enough, there you go. And so there you go, that's a simple dissolve. <laughs> okay. Uh, another really big deal about, um, about making movies is that when you're filming uh, your, your subjects in, in, in one environment, you don't really have 100% control of your light at all times. Um, certainly in a, in a space like this where there's a lot of different light sources and different styles of lighting, um, you're just kind of shooting and you're not going to bring in a whole bunch of lights and gels and stuff like that to affect everything. So uh, one of the things that you can do that, that is traditionally done fairly late in the edit process actually is, is actually color correction. And I'm not seeing where the color correction widget went off to here. the view effect list. Working on a 1024 screen is a little bit difficult for video editing. Highly recommend against it if you can at all help it. So I'm, I'm kind of clearing out some of the space. And you can actually set this up um, with, with your own layouts so that when you do color correction, you can simply hit a keyboard combination or switch to a different layout. And you can have an editing layout, a color correction layout, and all these other kinds of things. So. Um, so this essentially, this is the effect that I've just applied to this clip. Um, there's transitions, which are ways to get from one film strip to another. And then there are effects, which actually look at one film strip and say, well, what do you want me to do to this film strip? How do you want me to process it? What, what kind of effect do you want me to have over it? Um, and so on. And there's, a, there's a, again, just a lot more than I've even been able to look at um, in the short time that I've revisited Katie and Live, uh, especially since I'm not at the stages of doing effects yet on, on anything that I'm editing. Um, but there's, there's just a huge amount of things. And there's even stuff um, for broadcast video and stuff like that. So I mean, a lot of really cool stuff that you can play around with. Um, definitely exciting. Um, so this is. Uh, That I need to get rid of. There we go.
to reset that. Okay. So there are three primary channels to, to most digital video. I mean, it, it, there are actually different kinds of video, but we'll go with that for now. Um, and it goes in complementary colors. So red and blue are complementary. So to add red is to subtract blue, or to um, add green is to subtract magenta. Um, The, the, the bluer the, the frame, typically the, the colder and, and less friendly it appears. Um, the, the warmer it is, typically the, the more that we think of it being as a, a very human kind of environment, something warm and, and inviting. Um, and since I Imagine there was a lot of fluorescence and stuff like that out there, although I, I don't really know. Um, then you might want to sometimes add magenta uh, to to your to your if it, if you shot in fluorescence. Uh, you can go crazy with this kind of stuff and give it any kind of look that you want. Um, I'm having a really hard time. I should look at my screen, not yours, I guess. So let me see if I can turn this off and back on. So we're going to add a little bit of, that might be a bit much, a little bit of red. And a little bit of yellow to warm the whole scene up. Wow, that looks totally different on my screen. So. I'll try to correct it a little bit more for yours, I guess. Okay, well, let's go with that for now. So there's the before. This looks completely different on mine. But anyway, there's the before and there's the after. So you can kind of figure out what kind of overall look and feel you want on, of your scene. Now, we could take this, leave it on. We could take these settings. Save it as like the color correction for this hallway, and then load it back in for the coffee for the coffee scene. Um, I don't think it's going to work because they're two different shots, and they probably would actually need their own their own one. But let's just pretend like we want to do that. So now we can add an effect here. Color correction, three point balance. Actually, was it three point balance or was it curves? Okay. Curves. And we can now reload from a preset. If I can find it somewhere. I'm not remembering how to re re reload from presets. But I've done that at, uh, at my work computer, and I 
I guess I must have it configured differently or something. But you can you can add you can have plenty of presets on your on your um, effects and again your layouts and then load them at any time you want during your project and it just loads all the same settings. And then what I typically do is I modify it a little bit more just based on the the individual setup. Um, you know, if, if the lighting was a little bit different in this shot compared to the other, uh, you can adjust for that. So that's how I typically work it. Um, so once you've got your, sh your, your movie finished, or your, at least a, a good cut of it, um, then it's time probably to uh, export. So exporting is actually really simple. Um, Let's save it first, just so that we don't lose anything. And the render button uh, right here up in the main toolbar, I th thought it was in the file menu as well, but maybe it's not. Uh, render gives you a render menu. Uh, the render menu is really straightforward. You're going to see more or less uh, codecs along the side, depending on your original setup. So um, if you didn't configure certain things uh, when you first installed, then you're not going to see all this stuff. Uh, most notably, the, the raw DV. Um, that, if I'm not mistaken, depends on the Firewire libraries. Um, and so if you don't install that, you can still install Kdenlive, Live, but it, it might not be there. Uh, because um, you haven't installed all the correct libraries. But what you do have support for will be here in the left column. You can choose your, 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 your favorite uh, preset um, and then save it to wherever you want to, to save it to. Um, you can affect it here, like the, you can scale it down if you know that you're going to send it you're going to try to email it to someone you need it to be very small you could you could scale it down down in size it started out life as 640 by 480 so you could cut it in half 320 by 240 um, you can uh, this is a really big feature at least for me not not so much for anyone not working with 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 other editors on a project but superimposing an overlay on the footage is actually a really big deal it's called a burn in and when you send your footage to another editor, um, if they're also working on your same project and they are your, they're looking at your edit and they see something weird or they see something they have a question about or want to add to, having this uh, overlay of where, of where in the project you actually were uh, is really, really helpful. It keeps you guys keep in sync, literally. So for um, not, not the final project, but for stuff that you're sending back and forth with other editors, doing an overlay is, is a huge, huge help. Um, and then you can also do the, you can select if you just want a little snippet like a test render, you could do just the selected zone or you can do the full project and then you can render to file. Or again, if it's something that you're gonna reuse um, over and over, you can generate the script that it would have run um, and then run it later on yourself. I, I've never done that because I usually actually do this whole thing myself in the command line with FFmpeg, so I've never actually done that yet. I'm sure I will. It's a, it seems like a really good feature. Um, and then there's uh, lots of different ways to render it out, as I've said, so we'll just choose something fairly moderate, and we'll call it self-2011. And render. And so this is just kind of letting you know uh, all your different jobs that you've got queued for your render. Um, and so that's just kind of going. Um, really nice option, shut down the computer after rendering. It's cool. If you're rendering overnight and you go home for the day, uh, you can make sure that your computer kind of shuts itself down gracefully after the, the whole big job that you're, you're, you're processing. I haven't gotten to that scale yet, but it's been something that I've done in the past, so I'm, I anticipate using it. Uh, it's almost finished because it's only a couple of seconds. That was the first pass uh, to analyze the video, and now it's doing the second pass of where it's actually writing out the uh, video to file. You should be able to see it in a minute. Yeah. 
Any questions while we wait for this marvelous masterpiece to render? Yes. Yeah, so I'm going to repeat that into the microphone basically because because um, he didn't, well, my, I didn't bring you the mic. So, um, Paul Friels, ladies and gentlemen. Um, so, yeah, what he's saying is that um, there is software now started by the GNOME project and being ported or maybe already ported over to Color D um, to manage color profiles, meaning that when I look at my screen, I can look up at this screen and actually make sure that we, we are all seeing the same actual color temperature. Um, I would have still had to come in a little bit earlier and configure that on the, on the, on the projector in my monitor, um, or I would have had to take the time to establish a color profile for my monitor. Um, but that's huge. That is a huge deal because it's been something that's been kind of a uh, problem uh, for a lot of uh, Linux users in the past because uh, on others, I mean, if you're, if I'm sending it to another editor and they say, you know, that, that one scene that you made look a little blue, that's way too blue. I'm like, no, it's not. I'm looking at it right here. How do you know? So, um, so yeah, there's uh, color management stuff that, I mean, I actually didn't even know about. So, thank you. <laughs> I'll have to look into that. Yeah, you can get those little spiders and stuff like that. Those are really nice, but... Yeah, they are a little bit expensive too. Yeah, it makes. Oh my gosh! There it is. There's the project. Um, what screen would you base your profiles on? Well, I mean, that's, that's, there, you're, you're going for consistency. You're not going for quote unquote true color because there's no such thing as true color. Like, we're, there's no such actual thing as a true red or a true blue. That's just our eyes telling us that's a very blue blue, isn't it? Well, yes, you know, there's, there's no such thing. So you, you go for consistency across all known monitors. Um, at the film school I work at, we, we spend days doing that to every single computer screen in the place so that if a student sits down at one workstation with a, a document that they're going to print, uh, you know, like a photograph that they're going to print, it looks exactly the same on every computer. So. Like Pantone and Kodak and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I was. Yeah. I don't actually do that, though, to be honest. I, I, I prefer to look at it in, because the lighting environments are going to change from like computer lab to computer lab. So honestly, I like to go to the, the computer lab and say, okay. Within this lab, they're all going to want it to look the same. I'm going to do this like by eye with a couple of different photographs. Well, I guess, so I guess that would be what you're talking about, like the known, you know, like we have a set of photographs that we use, different skin tones, different objects in nature, stuff like that, and we base it off of that. It's not an exact science. It's more like what, what do we, you know, what, what does it match and what do we want it to look like. So, And I think, I think I'm out of time. Are there any other questions? Quick questions, I guess. Uh, because of these non-stretching, fast forwards, slow down. 
I don't know. I don't. I don't probably. I mean, you saw the list of uh, effects, so I'm gonna. I'm gonna guess that it does, but I have not yet. Uh, I'm I'm two months into using this, and all the projects that I'm editing right now are in the stage of the rough cut. So I'm not sure, but I bet it is. The Freeor um, pack that you have to install um, is really, really supposed to be like incredible for for all kinds of cool effects, and that's probably where most of those effects came from. I'll bet. So probably, but I'm not sure. And that's it. So check out slackermedia.info. That's the documentation project that I maintain on how to do all this kind of stuff on Linux. It's not actually specific to Slackware. It's really helpful for all kinds of distributions to learn about uh, multimedia on Linux, um, or at least what I currently at that moment know about multimedia on Linux. So check that out. And uh, thanks for coming to my talk. As a service leader in cloud computing, all we do is hosted computing. To us, the cloud is just the next generation of hosting. And as someone who's been in the hosting industry for 12 years, we feel we're in a unique position to really help bring these two worlds together, these different sets of technologies, and to help companies embrace this new world and this great new tool that allows faster innovation. Not only is it about us being responsive and accountable, but it's about us doing more for you. WebOS, an OS that works the way that you do. Across all your devices, HP Slate and WebOS, HP.